I'm really interested in hearing how actual practitioners involved in building a retirement savings might react to this broad overview. And I think this broad overview is kind of a description of the current work I'm interested in and doing that is very different from my graduate work, but I don't think anyone's interested in that, right? And that work is really understanding the connection between contemporary inequality and the kinds of monetary and fiscal regimes we've built. And in particular, what I'm going to do with this presentation and my larger, hopefully, work is try to undergird it within a political economy. Advance the slide, the title, that should kind of give you guys a hint of how we got to this regime, how it's been politically sustainable, and more, most importantly, how it's changing, especially during the pandemic, which I will argue is really a breaking point and a test case for a new kind of emerging regime of distribution. Let's start with the facts, right? What does inequality look like in America and what you know parameters are we talking about when we talk about inequality? This might be a little you know, obvious, but there are really two kinds of inequality. There is wealth inequality, which is an inequality in the stock of wealth, right? And it's quite stark. 50% of total wealth or net worth of assets, as we define it in the Z1 or the flow of funds of, uh, that the Federal Reserve publishes as data, which shows the ownership and distribution of assets, is owned by 1% of the population. 22% of that total is owned by the next 40%. Um, and that is stark. It gets even starker if you break it down along other, other dimensions, for example, race in which the average black family owns only 23,000 in net worth, and the average one white family, 184,000. And what is even more interesting is that doesn't matter as you go through education levels, right? And that speaks to why wealth is important, as we'll get to it, is because it's intergenerational. It provides a transfer. But there's also a different kind of inequality. There's income inequality, right? Which is the inequality of flows, right, of income you get from salary, wealth, and other benefits. And that one is also extremely skewed. Um, wages have only gone up 8.7% uh, since 1973, while productivity has gone up 72.2%. Uh, 72 now, that 87 is the median wage. If we take the mean wage, it's actually a little bit of a different story. It's at 42.5%, which already says there are heavy outliers in terms of wage distribution. And in general, labor's share of the economy has only gone up 63.3% as labor's productivity has gone up 72.2%. Now, which of these should we care about? This is actually a way more interesting question than we would think at face value. Should we care about wealth inequality? Obviously, I think a lot of us will say yes, right? Is because we, as we have seen already, wealth is a long-term investment that allows for intergenerational mobility. And wealth is also a level of power and a group's investment in society, in a society, as many political scientists and sociologists will point out. But there are some people who say we shouldn't care about wealth inequality, and we should really be more interested in income inequality. To be quite honest, I'm actually kind of sympathetic to those points of views. And there's a couple of reasons why. Well, the value of wealth is dependent on interest rates and market values, and it fluctuates, right? So it's not something we can always measure accurately compared to incomes, which have a real purchasing effect, right? And that's a real quality of life. And then wealth as a stock is a liquid. So it's not always immediately accessible, and thus it doesn't always come out, it, and thus it always doesn't line up with welfare measures. And finally, something I honestly forgot to put on this slide is a lot of extremely unwealthy people by measure are also people with high incomes. Think about it, for example, as people freshly out of professional or graduate school with a lot of debt who have a high lifetime earning potential in theory, but have very low net worths compared to someone who's more middle income, but has lower amounts of debt and has lower amounts of lifetime income uh, potential. So, what I want to do in this presentation is actually say that setting these up against one another doesn't make sense if you want a deeper explanation of why our society has become much more equal along both parameters. 
And what we should really be interested in is the distribution of assets and what that distribution does. My argument is going to be that this isn't a natural quote unquote phenomenon of any market, but it's a market, it's a phenomenon of political decisions. None of them that were uh, that were pre-planned or in some grand conspiracy that came from the Mount Pelerin Society, which a lot of intellectual historians will say is kind of the place where modern neoliberalism, for example, comes from. Where it comes from, though, is a shift of a new regime that came in post the 1970s inflation. And this is what the American household balance sheet generally looks like. I drew these uh, charts from a really great source that I don't think a lot of people know about because it's relatively new. It's called the Distributed Financial Accounts of the United States. Um, it's a effort that was done at the Federal Reserve Board of Governors to rectify the survey of consumer finances, which I'm sure many of you know about as professionals, which is a snapshot of the household, and the Z1 flow of funds accounts, which I constantly reference, which are the slightly less known, but they are essentially an accounting of uh, ownership and uh, of debts and um, uh, liabilities across asset classes. And by rectifying the two, you get a snapshot of what social groups own what assets and what debts. And the, the picture is really interesting. Once we drill into the wealth and into wealth inequality, we find something, we find that actually the middle, right? The, the top one and the top 9%, their assets are heavily weighted towards corporate and non-corporate equity or business equity. And the middle is heavily weighted towards retirement savings in the 401k system, which I don't have to tell anyone here is a huge part of assets. And also, and in the IRA system, obviously, but also real estate, housing. Housing has really become the bedrock of the so-called middle class, whatever that is, statistically. The bottom uh, the bottom 50% has very few assets, this, these blue lines, and that's incredibly concerning. Right. It's even more concerning when we begin to think that uh, look through more recent research that looks at how assets rents essentially are accumulated. And what it shows is the one percent, it's not as much a highly paid professional or a banker or a financial systems person. Well, and, and obviously it is those people. And but it's also your local car dealer. It's also your local car uh, contractor. And they're getting their income from the ownership of business equity, of course, but that's being booked as income through a pass-through, right? So there, there's a lot of very interesting compositional questions that you can get at by looking through these accounts. And they answer all kinds of things. I'm not going to put this in the presentation, but I think they explain a lot about voting patterns, for example, of why, for example, very high-income people with low amounts of assets will vote one way and lower income from people, but that have like large amounts of fixed assets will vote another way. There's actually pretty interesting research on the political science literature that has explored that. And I think it's very important. So to go on, this is probably the most annoying and difficult part of this presentation, but to understand how this plays out and why it's a function of markets and political decisions, we need to have a bit of a theory of wealth inequality. And the, the theory I'm going to take is from two people is from Suresh Naidu's interpretation of Thomas Piketty. That's uh, a lot of numbers on the screen. Uh, if you're interested, we can kind of go through what they mean. But Thomas Piketty, who wrote Capital in the 21st Century, it's one of those big books that a lot of people have on their shelves, but no one has really fully read. That's fine. I may be among those people. He has a kind of neat theory about why there's high amounts of wealth inequality. He thinks that this is an, a thing endogenous to a capitalist economy, that wealth will always be higher, a true higher than income, because he, and he builds this little model here that at the top, that wealth, W divided by Y, which is income is a function of really the save, uh, the rate of savings over the rate of GDP growth. And that the rate of savings accruing to owners of assets is just this alpha term, which is just the pro capital share uh, and that the function of the profit rate. And then through laborious statistical study, he finds that there is a general rule that the rate of profit is always going to be higher than the growth rate. So wealth inequality will always increase under capitalism. Uh, because of that kind of supply side or savings view of wealth, 
his preferred solution is the taxation of wealth. That's the wealth tax we've spoken about. And it's a global one. And that's not a bad solution. That's the one that's actually not a terrible one. But we'll, as we go on, we'll see why that's not A, the only solution. B, that doesn't actually tell us why we have the wealth inequality we have now. Um, as Piketty, I, I'll probably get a little bit ahead of myself, but Piketty also thinks that the level of equality we saw in the post-war era was an exception to the rule and we can never go back to it. I am not so sure. And here's why. There's a different way of looking of the, out, out of this kind of wealth to income ratio that Suresh and I do presents in this really wonderful essay. And he builds it differently. He keeps this alpha term up top, right? The amount that the capitalist or the wealth owner can extract out of incomes. But he also divides it by these, these R terms, which are R finance and, the, and P. And all these R is essentially acknowledging that the stock of wealth is highly influenced by the current interest rate and the current valuation of a financial market. And the deeper a financial market exists, the more quote unquote financialized an economy is, the more owners of assets can pull future incomes that those assets present, this alpha term up top, they can pull them into the current period and thus get more liquid wealth, right? Um, this is what he calls a Keynesian divider because it's derived off of this insight that Keynes had, right? That all wealth and all value is really liquidity. And thus everything comes out of the level of finance. And that gives us a new dimension to think about when we think about where wealth and income line up. They come out of the degree and the organization of the financial market. And that, in my opinion, is a political decision and one that's historical and one we can think about evolving. And the reason we have our kind of coalition, which they call a stagnationary one, is because of the inflation of the 1970s. My argument for the rest of this presentation is going to be that essentially the response to the inflations of the 70s has been to put our economy on a bias, one that rewards the accumulation of assets over the, uh, over the rise in incomes from, from work. And one that takes the risk of inflation as higher as the as a more dangerous thing than the benefits of growth. And that's why I call it stagnationary. And there's a few interesting features here, right? What we've seen since the start of the stagnationary kind of coalition coming to power, which we generally term with the Volcker shock of the 19th of 1979 and Reagan's breaking of the unions in 80 to 81 is that the cost of wages, wages and salaries have collapsed, except for one period, really, which is in the late, 80, late 80s, we saw a little bit of a return, and then we saw a real return in people's earnings in the late 90s during the tech bubble. And that's going to be important. Keep that in mind. The next thing, but to understand why that context exists, we need to understand what inflation is. And I think that's going to be probably the most interesting part to a lot of you, because I have a very different story about why inflation happens than what you will learn in a basic macro 101 course. One thing that economists have learned, especially since the recession and since the start of QE, is that the standard story that monetary aggregates will predict inflation is just wrong. We don't know where inflation comes from. A lot of there have been several studies done that look at very long, large historical data sets for period of for inflationary spikes and hyperinflations. And they say, yes, you know, there is an increase in monetary aggregates at that time. That's mechanical. But those increases actually don't predict those in, in inflationary episodes because there are other increases in monetary aggregates that don't end with any inflation. I first use a theory of inflation and prices that is a little different. It's derived from the work of Mikhail Kaletsky, uh, the Polish uh, economist who worked with John Maynard Keynes um, and actually probably uh, discovered the general theory before Keynes. And his argument is that the price level isn't marginal. It's a function of markups, i.e. firms' 
will try to mark up as much as the market can bear to make a profit level. That's the simplest way to put it. Now, the level of that markup is a function of several things. One is what he calls the degree of monopoly in markets, right? Which is just how competitive markets are. Within that, firms really will look at two kinds of uh, two kinds of parameters. One, which is going to be the wage level, right? Which is one of the which is probably the largest bit of overhead, the largest cost to production. But the other one is going to be capacity. And a firm owner will not run their firm at full capacity for several reasons. One, just if you think about physical plant, that's going to wear your plant down if you're in a kind of capital intensive form of production. And two, you want to have some smear capacity around in general for the, you know, for uh, for prop for problems that you can ramp up. And when wages go up in general, you would think that actually. Firms might like that because that means there are more consumers overall buying things. And if there is no shock to input costs, capitalists, firm owners being forward looking will actually invest in more capacity to fill the new demand. That is unless there is something else going on. And my argument in my historical work that I do with a colleague of mine named Tim Barker, who is at Harvard, and we are come writing a series of papers about this, is that the 1970s were a pretty unique storm, one in which you had hugely rapidly growing wages due to the boom caused by the Vietnam War, and one in which investment in capacity couldn't go up to meet the new demand that this, these new earnings created. And that's for two reasons. The simplest one are the oil shocks. And there's actually a really beautiful kind of sign here. If you look at the capacity utilization, they just spikes right around the oil shocks or, uh, of 72 and then uh, 78, right? Which tells you a lot, right? Firms are juicing up their capacity in order to meet this new supply side constraint. But they're not really investing overall in new capacity to meet this new demand. And that's interesting. The, the one sector that's not true is in oil and gas, actually, in the 70s, because they're investing in plenty of capacity. That's eventually what gets us out of this, I think. But that's, again, a very different story. That's a longer, more complicated presentation. There is another reason uh, firms are limited in their capacity utilization, uh, ability to invest in capacity is because other overhead costs are also extremely high because of the Cold War and uh, demand from the military for certain kinds of input goods, which make them make consumer industries, right? Where you really do see CPI inflation, it makes it very hard for them to expand. So what we get as a response, as sociologists like Greta Krippner would argue, is a kind of set of workarounds to get around this problem. And that in summary, that workaround is a low investment economy, except for a one period, really, where you see an upslope both in capacity investment and utilization. And that is the late 1990s. Now, why is that important? It's right here. If you just, I, I'm going to draw on the slide because I realized I can do that. Um, or I think you can see that little hump right here, um, that little red hump. Now, why is that really important? That has an impact on the labor market. This is a measure, this is the employment population ratio for the pri for prime age workers. Um, I chose it from around 1990 to the contemporary period because that incorporates more or less the full entry of women into the workforce. So it looks contemporary and you can, you can make some conclusions from it. And as you can see, it peaks right in the late 90s during the tech investment boom, and it begins to go down. It begins to go down after that, uh, after that recession, and it goes up slightly during the housing boom. It collapses through the slow recovery post-2008, and it just begins to look like it might be getting to the, two th uh, the late 90s highs right before the COVID crisis. And then obviously the COVID crisis hits and it's like nothing we've seen for a very long time. Now, why is this important to inequality? Unlike unemployment, the employment population ratio 
is a sign of bargaining power. Ernie Tedeschi, who is now going to be actually an advisor to the White House and is just one of the most interesting economists you can follow on the internet. Uh, his handle is right here. Um, he did a study, right? And he created something called the Wage Phillips Curve. Um, and the Phillips Curve is this infamous relationship that seems to have collapsed after the 70s. People at least said that. But his version, which, uh, and it was supposed to say, to tell you the relationship between unemployment and inflation, it supposedly is gone. But if you look at it in this original formulation, as Phillips formulated it, which is on wages and salaries, there is an extremely strong relationship between the prime age employment population ratio and just how many people are in the workforce and the ability for salaries to go up. Um, what we've done, I will argue, is that in trying to avoid inflationary spikes, we've dis uh, we've eliminated the ability of laborers to negotiate because of tight labor markets. Every time since the 80s, we've come close to full employment. We have increased interest rates, which has which has ended a co economic contraction, and that has um, and that has lowered interest rates. We've also over relied on monetary policy instead of fiscal policy, and because of that, instead of you of dealing with downturns by fostering new industries by fostering tight labor markets, we've simply played again with interest rates and have hoped that markets would come out with uh, with efficient outcomes that would uh, get us back to full employment. They haven't, right? Precisely, and we've avoided large fiscal action until now precisely because of the fear of inflation, and that's driven up inequality. But there's another side to the balance sheet, right? You wouldn't expect people to be happy with this situation for a long period of time. And when this new kind of regime emerged in the early 80s to the mid 80s, a lot of very smart people said it can't last. People can't be this dissatisfied with this level of underemployment, underpay, et cetera. Well, it did last. And my answer is it lasted because it worked at least a little bit because we turned housing into a financial asset, into a capital asset. And that offset the pit of lower wages to a lot of social groups. Now, has this worked? Well, it's a good question. Before the Great Recession, it did work. Um, it certainly worked. Um, but after the Great Recession, not so much, right? Even just looking at the predicted trend that um, uh, birth cohorts in the 70s would have for wealth versus the actual trend, which is orange, and then the rates of uh, home ownership, again, blue and orange, as you would predict from various SCFs, it hasn't really worked. Um, it did. Um, now, if you go down the composition, it's actually worked for wealthier families a bit, and it's also worked for a certain cohort of people, which are mid to older boomers and younger Gen Xers. And those people have actually kind of recovered a little bit from the shock of the housing crisis and have actually expanded their net worth via housing. Um, what it has, uh, but in the long run, you know, this housing wealth model, um, it may not have worked as well as we thought it did. Um, if you look at an index, housing, and I don't think I have to tell a lot of people here, housing doesn't do as well as non-household wealth. Um, in the long run, house, housing also has a high sharp ratio because of its extremely liquid and it's, uh, I'm sorry, a low sharp ratio, excuse me, low sharp ratio because it's extremely liquid and it's very, it's very dependent on where you wind up living and your geography. And that doesn't mean you don't want home ownership because the way we structure our housing system, you're just giving away money to a landlord if you don't own a home. Now, as we'll see, that's not the only way we can structure this system and we can have better incentives for wealth accumulation if we really want to. But going on, you know, it's also created these generational and age uh, and racial fissures. Um, Glazer and Gurko really looked at this and they found that housing wealth, you would expect it to be, you know, more uh, concentrated at higher ages. That's normal, but it's become even more concentrated at higher ages. And this is the infamous millennial gap, right? Um, I am a victim. I have to live for work in a very expensive area. It is going to be very hard for me to own a house. I'll be quite blatant, right? This, um, uh, 
so the wealth accumulation model is starting to break down. And that was, in my opinion, um, and I think from pretty good primary source research, we've done what allowed lower wages to not have a dramatic political pushback. Now, does asset wealth even matter? Well, I would argue it does as an explanatory uh, variable, right? Because if you just look at a cr really naive cross-country comparison, the United States has as much median household wealth as Norway or Denmark. And it's actually, I, I didn't include this in the chart and probably should have, uh, U.S. has a higher household wealth um, than Germany. But our consumption patterns are very different. Uh, the average household in Norway and Denmark consumes more. Uh, and in America, we have a private rate. Um, we have a uh, privately uh, based retirement system, one that puts a lot of onus on your industry to manage people's cash flows through their life. We have a system of wealth accumulation that's based on housing and the ownership of housing rather than long term leases or public investment in housing like many other countries do, and we just don't have a wealth transfer system. And because of that, despite seemingly having, uh, despite having a lot of assets owned by a lot of households, we don't really see the results, right? What is important isn't necessarily what as, uh, isn't necessarily the level of wealth, but how it's organized in my view. Now, what is happening now? Why do I think we're at a turn? Well, I think we live, the COVID pandemic has allowed the United States to build a kind of overnight welfare state, right? Including high unemployment insurance, including cash payments, including a lot of, excuse me, other forms of quiet support to household finances. And we've seen that the results in the high savings rate. It is dramatic. Net worths are going to be come out extremely different out of the pandemic and in a direction that we wouldn't have predicted last year. And this is all due to a different kind of, we're really rethinking inflation. The person at the head of this charge has been Chairman uh, Jerome Powell, who I think is a heroic figure. Um, and his argument is that 2%, it's more, is more a, alarm trigger and a very loose one than is high unemployment. In his statements, Jerome Powell has consistently told us that the primary goal now of the Federal Reserve is maintaining full employment. The secondary role goal is to maintain an average 2%, not a two per hard 2% rate of inflation. Um, that's incredibly interesting in a couple of levels. One, because it's flipped the way central bankers generally talk in which they primarily are interested in controlling inflation and will use employment, the second part of their mandate as kind of a variable to control inflation. Second is it takes 2% far less seriously than it should be taken and then what we've um, taken it as. I haven't found a real concrete reason we got the 2% target other than an offhand remark once by a governor that became kind of embedded as a policy reason. There's no good reason 2% is the optimal rate of inflation in this country, and perhaps it's probably too low. I think we can live to 3 to 4%, and that would be very good for house, some household balance sheets, especially those of us that are in debt, for example, for their education, and in general, those of us that depend on wages, that should give a little bargaining power. I think the next revolution in thought that we are also seeing, also from, I think, Chairman Powell, who's really led this, is that monetary policy isn't the only game in town anymore, right? As Chairman Powell pointed out over and over, the Fed can only do so much. What we really need is fiscal policy. We need large amounts of government investment, debt-driven or not. We're beginning to see that change in the Biden administration. We're in a different ball game. It's likely the ARA is going to close inequality in at least the short term, especially given childhood cash support payments. We're definitely entering a new world. Now, what do we need to do to keep up this progress? I think we need to think about 
two areas. One area is going to be what kind of things do we store these new income flows in, right? There's maybe income support that is going to come in from an expanded welfare state, but we also need to think about alternative state supported wealth products, right? That means what do we put those incomes in as households? There have been several ideas for that that I think are extremely encouraging. Uh, Professor Merton and uh, the Black Shoals Merton uh, model has encouraged a kind of retirement savings bond scheme that he calls the selfies model, which I think everyone should read. It's quite an interesting paper. Um, Morgan, Professor Morgan Ricks out of New Chicago has suggested the creation of savings accounts with a guaranteed high rate of return right on the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. Um, which would also mechanically be an anti-inflationary measure allowing the Federal Reserve to expand its balance sheet more freely because it would have a consequent expansion on the other side that is not either a bank or a, uh, a treasury of expansion. Um, there, I think there needs to be a wholesale rethinking of how we do housing in this country would really need more options for non-home ownership that would free up savings to go into more liquid and more uh, more liquid and less uh, volatile assets in a way that me, uh, doesn't have you give away all of your income to a landlord without building up any equity. There have been some interesting policy proposals there, including uh, what some people call, uh, what are called um, um, equity sharing agreements with landlords. Uh, there have long-term leases like you see in practically every other industrialized country in the world other than the UK and the Netherlands where a great majority of people actually lease their house for a long period of time rather than outright own it. Um, there are some other ones like community land banks that I think might have some potential to rework the way we own houses. Far more interesting, at least to me, is another is what fiscal policy actually looks like. Are we going to have a fiscal policy, which is generally stimulative, or are we going to have a real industrial policy? And the reason a real industrial policy matters is a concerted industrial policy can be anti-inflationary. It could allow for a long-term expansion of wages while also looking at the supply side to make sure there are no supply side bottlenecks that will keep firms from investing in new capacities to meet the wage, uh, uh, meet new demand that's created by these wage uh, increases in wage growth. And I think that's um, a real kind of frontier area in economic thought that we really need to do more research in is what that would look like. One example, for example, is if we do the Green New Deal, it might be inflationary up front, but lowering solar and wind costs, if we can get the transmission, the battery storage right, will actually lower uh, energy costs so much that it may be deflationary. And that is something that I think neither the designers of the Green New Deal nor its opponents have really tackled. It presents a very different macroeconomic picture. These are all horizon issues. And I think if this is the path we pursue, if we abandon this intellectual deadweight of the 1970s as this kind of Damocles, sort of Damocles above our policy, above our heads when making policy, we may wind up in a more equal society. Of course, given that this will change the way assets are distributed, your profession really has a lot to think about, right? And how it will advise clients in this new, what I think is a new emerging policy regime. One that, quite frankly, I think has challenges, but has far more potential to change things. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you, Yakov. That was a, a great presentation. I certainly learned a lot. And, you know, I've, I've got a, a number of questions that I want to put to you, some of them my own, some of them that have been sent in by the audience. So I hope you'll, you're ready to tackle a few of those. Um, so let's see, which one do I want to start with? And it, perhaps... Could you define, when you say industrial versus financial policies, the difference between those two? And I, I appreciate the example of, say, the Green New Deal, right? That that might be an industrial policy that you could um, speak to. What, what would you say about that? Yeah, I mean, it's a subtle difference. Um, I think there are all kinds of ways you can do fiscal policy, right? Um, there is a 
way you can do fiscal policy that is just, you know, what we've been doing so far in the recession, which is just sending people money to close the consumption stopgap, right? That's good and fine, especially in an emergency. And it's probably just a good way of doing, you know, just general welfare policy. Um, but it's not actually building up new capacities in the economy, right? It's not going into new, either new areas of science, technology, or more importantly, something, uh, new areas of science and technology, actually something the United States has done a pretty good job in investing in, but it, for example, doesn't build in redundancies or resiliencies in supply chains, right? Um, that's something we haven't done a very good job in, right? right? All those, that's important. And I think that particular planning of investment, um, I'm going to, uh, you know, I'm going to, uh, talk my own book because that's a huge project we have going at the Bergruen Institute that we've just started, which is investment planning and the creation of an invest of investment planning authorities. The precise composition of demand that the government creates matters, right? What we put it into matters, and I think it needs to be planned over the long run. Right. Um, Maybe I'll actually, it reminds me of, and I'll, I'll skip back to your slide 13. I mean, that's kind mm -hmm. of the story that's being told in, in some of this. Absolutely. Right. Like the composition really does matter. And we need to think in the long run about what that composition means for labor markets and what we can do and what it means for breaking up bottlenecks in the supply side. I, I would go as far as to think the proper industrial policy is more effective than monetary policy at um, containing inflation, and without the without the kind of you know broad sword effect that monetary policy has of also to containing inflation, ending high uh, economic expansion. Right. This yeah. gives us a scalpel to work with rather than yeah. you know, a big butchery knife. <laughs> Do you feel? I think that part of this discussion about inflation is often overlooked it, it, the focus is so squarely put on the monetary side and the you know the printing of, of money as some people might say but they, they, they overlook the fact that there's a whole you know utilization and capacity side that needs to be discussed as well so yeah ab absolutely and it's you know it's it's a hard discussion to have because like you know as an economist it's very hard for me to understand as I've been digging it into or especially as an economic even as an economic historian we tend to be a little more material right um you really need to talk to engineers for this, <laughs> yeah, right? Totally. Um, you need to have a real dialogue between engineering, economics, history to kind of understand this because each capacity shock is unique. It uh, Its effects can be inflationary. They can also be deflationary. You know, one really interesting thing we've learned from the pandemic is if we think if these shocks look transitory, companies will ration before they increase prices. That's what we saw with toilet paper. Uh, and there was a really interesting article in the New York Times where they talked to the toilet paper manufacturers and they thought, you know, not a huge deal. We're going to have a little problem up front, but we're not increasing prices because we just simply will move demand, demand that was once commercial into the household market. You know, that's not something you learn in Econ 101. You actually have to go to the companies, talk to them, talk to the supply chain engineers, and they yeah. will often tell you that. And then because it was transitory, they didn't increase prices. They just rationed. Yeah. It's fascinating. Yeah. We really learned a lot from this experience. I wish it didn't take this much misery and death. Indeed. Indeed. Um, a few other questions. I'm glad we've actually got a nice amount of time to dialogue on some of these, Yakov. Um, and this is a personal question. You know, do you think the fact that, that productivity has increased for so long while wages have been relatively stagnant has it almost created like extra slacker room for all of this stimulus? I mean, there, there's, yeah, I, I, that I, makes I, sense. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Right. You know, we have a lot of, we have a lot of room to go probably until we hit that moment where we have to make hard choices between employment capacity and inflation. Right. right. Um, that doesn't mean we're not going to see inflation the next year. It just means the question is whether it's going to be transitory or whether it's going to also, um, you know, have passed through to broad markets. I'm, I'm sure there's going to be inflation in your, uh, in airline prices or like, I'm sorry, airline ticket prices. I am sure of it. Um, whether that is going to affect other 
baskets of commodities is a huge question. You know, um, as a lot of commodity traders will note, swine flu is a huge thing to look out for, right? If that uh, kills off hog herds, there's just going to be a change in the demand structure and that might change capacities and that can have inflationary effects, right? Um, that's all things to kind of look out for, but um, the question of how long they last, whether the uh, whether our supply chains can adjust or not, that's more important than, you know, like the monetary aggregates. Right. We, we, we do, I think, have a lot of overhead. That's becoming very quickly the new concern census, which is just so different than what we experienced in 2009. Hmm, right. And to that end, here's a question, you know, could you speak to the complexity of what the CPI is and, and how there can be sort of dynamics at play in terms of inflation in different parts of the economy that might not be readily apparent in that figure? Is that, is that important to, to address? Yeah, I, I, I can say a little bit to it. I'm not definitely not like the specialist on CPI composition. Uh, the, the person who really knows the most about this right now, I think, is Emi Nakamura, who is like probably, you know, the most exciting young economist now in the profession. A lot of people think she is. She's at Berkeley. And yeah, CPI composition is extremely complicated. It's actually kind of almost a, it's a theoretical, you know, composite basket of goods, right? Whether it represents actual people's consumption patterns or not is a very good question. You know, Nakamura found that, you know, in the seventies, if you treat CPI as given, there's not as much uh, or diff if you look at different consumption baskets, I believe in one of her papers, uh, a subsets of CPI, it's very hard to even say what in, what the effects of inflation were in the 1970s. It had very, 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 you know, different effects on different uh, social groups, huh. right? Um, it was definitely very painful for the middle class. It might not have been for some of the working poor. It, it's a very, very, it's, it's, inflation is always, as you know, that Hirschman quote kind of point uh, the article I pulled that Hirschman quote from, it points it out. Inflation is always a matter Let's of- who pull that back up here. Yeah, which one was it? I think slide 11. Yeah, this one. The larger article makes a really, really interesting point that like all of inflation is always a decision over distribution and who pays what, right? It's always a distributional kind of problem. And we, when his argument is states lose control of it over it, not when they lose control of the monetary aggregates, but- they use the monetary aggregates to paper over a distributional uh, conflict that, you know, the government can't resolve. It's a really great paper. Um, Maybe. Yeah. Well, just to riff off that, like that might be where it and probably is where the mortal fear of inflation often comes from, from policymakers. Right. Because if it does go out of control, the outcome is so unbelievably bad. Yeah, exactly. Right. And it's so easy to lose control over because it spirals. Right. Even if you drop expectations because expectations are really very strange. They've been doing very strange things in I think the last 10, 20 years where expectations of inflation have always been much higher than actual inflation, right? Um, even if you drop that uh, assumption, the conflicts it creates, the new kind of coalitions it creates, it makes it much harder to govern an economy. And that's really so key to actually controlling that rate. And that right. really does, I think, explain the politics around it. I think we should just be much more honest about that as right. a society, that all of these things have winners and losers. And we have to have, and the point of living in a democracy, a well-functioning democracy is we have an open conversation about who wins and who loses. Right. Well, it's really interesting. Um, Yakov, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll hit you with a few more questions. Um, sure, sure. The first one, I'm interested to see your reaction before maybe we even get into it. But the buzzword, you know, modern monetary theory, it's kind of like in the background of some of what we're describing now. Does that does that term mean anything to you? And do you feel like unpacking it perhaps for our yeah, listeners? Yeah, sure. So I'm a sympathizer to a lot of elements of MMT. I'm what's called a post-Keynesian, and MMT is a subset of post-Keynesian thinking. I wouldn't consider myself an mmt -er, uh, because I think MMT as a buzzword is actually, it doesn't represent what I think MMT actually argues for, which is a much deeper, much more complicated set of policy prescriptions sure. um, rather than just spend money. In fact, MMTers would, obje would and do object to that characterization of what they believe in. Um, the key argument of MMT, which I think is precisely correct, is that the 
constrained on what they call a monetary sovereign entity. And there you can't be much more monetarily sovereign than the United States. The rest of the world, as I've argued out there, literally uses our debt for their money to finance things like trade, right? Um, the constraint on that isn't, you know, bond vigilantes or some arbitrary budget number. It's really inflation. That's the constraint. Um, I think that's absolutely right. The, the, and I think now MMT has one, uh, maybe I would argue, excuse me, that's not just a uniquely MMT idea. That's generally a post-Keynesian idea. MMTers might disagree. Um, but certainly that idea, I think, has won the policy debate. Even those opposed to higher spending now will argue that the barrier isn't, you know, bond vigilantes or quote unquote, having your money called in by China, which is ridiculous. Um, it's the inflation barrier. And that's a real, I think, intellectual victory for uh, an, a real positive thing. MMT has a different theory, has many more components because MMT would object to saying, we just say spend money. MMT has an argument, for example, uh, a provocative one uh, that, taxes don't fund spending huh. and that the role of taxes is actually to be counterinflationary and the taxes are a better way of preventing inflation than monetary policy and that the rate of monetary policy uh, interest rate should be just as low as possible. Um, some of the implications of that have interesting things for bond financing. For example, they don't necessarily think that some of them, not all of them, don't necessarily think the U.S. Treasury should issue bonds to the public market and it should just be directly bought by the Fed huh. uh, because that drives wealth inequality. And that we, the, there are other interesting components to MMT. For example, their preferred social policy is a jobs guarantee, right? That uh, and the government should maintain a basic stock of jobs for anyone. And if there's a downturn, they should expand that stock and that should be the main reaction to downturns. Um, there's an argument that is a better anti-inflationary policy than welfare transfers. That part I honestly do not agree with. Uh, but I, I do think as a fellow traveler and sympathizer to MMT, I don't necessarily think MMT's position has been well documented in the press. It's not just spend money or print money. Yeah. It's a whole set of positions, some of which I think are correct, some of which are don't, right? That's a that's a great a great explanation, Yakov. It's something that comes up now and again in you know statements that are sent to me or even in interviews that I do. So I, I thought I thought I would ask you about that. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there, there's actually a great paper. One of their founders, Randy uh, Randy, uh, what's, what's his last name, um, put out. This says, "Please do not say Japan is doing MMT." <laughs> right. Um, you know, I'm, I'm one or two more questions, and I'm just curious for any concluding thoughts that you would share with our audience. Um, first one is, you know, it's just very broad, and is you know, you're in a position where you can research these topics, think deeply about them, and, and come up with policy solutions. I just wonder how you personally, you know, think about the role of what financial advisors do in this system, and, and the ways that they might be able to help push things in the right direction. You know, I, I think the vast majority of people would agree that lower levels of income inequality, you know, that would be a good thing. We can debate all day long how to get there, but it's a broad question. Yeah, Kopp, what would you say? I mean, look, first of all, I think I'm the luckiest person in the world. I get to sit around, do this, make a decent living doing this. I, I, I never thought I could do this. I don't even have to teach that much anymore. That's right. kind of amazing, which actually is a downside since I quite like teaching. Um, the, I think what financial advisors can do is the biggest thing a financial advisor does is educate. I mean, I know that from my friends who are financial advisors, who I work with every day, who I've actually learned the most from more than any academic, right? Because you actually have to deal with the consequence of policy actions and what they do to asset prices. I think that's the most important thing you can do is, you know, even beyond financial literacy, I think as I said, I think in a democratic society, um, we need to be really honest about trade-offs and who pays what. And I yeah. do think that's what a fiduciary does. You know, my 
one of my teachers, Perry Merling, who maybe some people actually even heard of because he taught a really famous MOOC on money and banking that I know a lot of practitioners taught, took and that I really learned a lot by TAing, right? Just on Zoom like this to groups of investment bankers and financial advisors, right? His argument is a lot of what a financial system is is actually quite simple, but we make it more complicated in our language because that lets us, you know, make some money. And yeah. I, when I was still in industry and I was working, you know, as a ba uh, back end person and in a, in a bank, you know, and that's how we made our money, right? But, you know, the I think a good financial advisor kind of you know, breaks through that language barrier and can actually explain these things in human terms, at least the ones I know who I think are exceptional, that's what they do, yeah, you know, yeah. and, and they make a lot of alpha, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Besides, just, you know, trading on this kind of thing, stuff, actually. Yeah, well, perhaps the final question, Yakov, and then we can conclude, you know, it, it, the the whole phenomenon that we saw in the markets with games, the price of GameStop stock and certain other stocks, you know, to me, it, it just tells this story of inequality in a different way, right? There is there is a sense out there that there is a, a certain degree of unfairness, whether it's in the financial market or the economy more broadly. And it can, you know, it has real teeth. And, and we need as practitioners in the industry to be aware of that and, and realize yeah. that we're not isolated from issues of inequality, even if we have, you know, wealthy clients and wealthy plans, you know, we're all connected here. Yeah. And, you know, the GameStop thing, it's I think it's extremely tragic on some level. Right. Because there is, I think, a lot of very smart people created a boom, made a lot of money off of it. And then a lot of people lost money on it. And that's precisely the kind of thing that we want to avoid as a society. And the real tragedy is that people thought they were sticking it to Wall Street, whereas I think Wall Street made a lot of money on that. Um I think it also says a lot about where price, what price is, and that precisely, you know, that uh, Suresh is kind of approach to things where price is really a function of liquidity, right? Um, well, that was made that was made clear on that the, whatever week when we saw the crazy yeah, they're, they're like yeah. you know how much wealth if you hold a portfolio of only Game Stock, suddenly you, your wealth inequality has suddenly has dramatically decreased and then it's dramatically increased so like wealth is a very you know moving well, target it, it reminds me of bitcoin too you know it, there, yeah, just, yeah. there are signs all over the place if you look for them that this is a, yeah. a real problem yeah exactly right and it gets back to more normal assets like you know your house right because if you were lucky enough to buy a house in san francisco in the 1970s for whatever personal reason you had your wealth is very different from someone who's bought the equivalent kind of house in Cleveland when they were worth about the same, right? That's and that's that's actually something I would call uncertainty, which is just okay to post Keynesian thinking as a whole, right? And that's not something we could rationally calculate risk on. That's something that's precisely why it's uncertainty rather than risk. Yeah. And actually, that's why we do, I think, need a lot more government intervention in these kinds of markets, because a government can bear uncertainty much more easily than a household balance sheet. It's just so much bigger to be blatant. Yeah. Uh, that that might be the other thing I could tell say. I think good financial advisors are very aware of that, at least the ones I interact with who are also theorists, actually, in their own right. They're very aware of the difference between risk and fundamental uncertainty. Yeah. Yeah. Well, perhaps we'll end it there, Yakov. I really enjoyed this conversation, your presentation and, you know, our dialogue. Um, I, you know, thank you so much for, for doing it. I don't know if you can include any, any parting I'm, thoughts. I'm, I'm, no, thank you for having me. Uh, it, it was a real pleasure. This is one of the nicest things I've had a chance to do. And I'm so happy if this could inform and make someone think or even help someone's practice. Though I'm not sure about the latter part. I just <laughs> well, think, cool. think certainly. And, you know, that's half the battle. So, Right. Um, yeah, well, you can go ahead and, and drop off now, Yakov. I'll just Thank say a very few, much. Yeah, a few parting words to everybody about the coming the sessions coming up. Right. Um, Good Thank you.